I am Tom Watkins. This film is coming to you courtesy of Warwickshire Wildlife Trust and Dunsmore Living Landscape. Traditional hedge land in the British countryside has been a prominent feature of the landscape for at least a few hundred years. Regionally, there are many styles of hedge land, but all styles generally follow the same principles. In this film, the style we are going to be watching is one of the most popular and it's called the Midland Bullock style. England is a country of mixed farms, and where cattle and corn grow side by side, you need hedges to keep stock from straying from one field to another and to give them shade in summer and a windbreak in winter. Firstly, let's look at some of the equipment. Many tools I use, but today we're going to concentrate on six, and these are a mattock, loppers, a pruning saw, a slasher, a Yorkshire bale hook, a Suffolk bale hook, and Staffordshire bale hook. Today I will be using the Staffordshire bale hook. When attending a potential hedge lane site, the first task will always be signing up. Siding up is creating a clean side of the hedge so you can access the base of the stems within the hedge easily. This involves removing side branches and anything that's going to get in your way during the hedge lane process. Generally, if you find any features from any past hedge laying, it is best to remove them. Soon, after good siding up, you will start to see your prominent stems appearing. These will form the framework of your hedge. Because siding up is hard work, seeing the stems appear is quite rewarding. Here are three examples of good stems for laying in this hedge. At this point, an experienced hedge layer will be able to judge the height of the finished hedge. Now we come to the act of pleaching. This is where we turn our stems into pleachers, the framework of the hedge. Using a bill hook, at a height three times the width of the stem. This earlier pleacher is showing the open stem cut at the desired angle to allow rainwater to run off the pleacher. This stops water from collecting at the base of the pleacher, which can cause the pleacher to rot over time. When making my first cut, I generally aim to cut the pleacher between 30 and 40 degrees. You cut the pleacher so there's enough sapwood left to keep the pleacher alive. This may only be a small sliver.
While doing this, it is important to put some downward pressure onto the stem, but not so much to cause the pleature to snap early. As you feel the tension come off the pleature, you'll start to get a feel for whether the pleature is ready to be laid over or not. Some experienced hedge layers can tell this from sound alone. To an experienced hedge layer, this is a positive sound, and one that tells them the stem has been laid correctly. Once your pleature has been laid, you will be left with a vertical stump. Using a bow saw or a pruning saw, this stump should be removed, leaving an angle similar to the surface cuss on the pleature. Again, adding the flow of rainwater coming off the stem. Your first attempts at pleaching may not produce the desired results. But over time and practice, experience will improve this. It is important to note that before you start any pleaching, the stem you're working on must be free from entanglement with the next stem. Once you've done a five meter run of pleaching, now is the time to start introducing stakes for support. Traditionally, coppiced hazel stakes were used which you can also use sawn timber stakes. Using the bill hook again, I point the stake ready to be driven into the ground. We really want our stakes to be equidistant. A good measure of this is the distance between your elbow and your fingertips. With repeating this process and gathering more experience, soon your hedge will start to take a really pleasing form. In the Midland Bullock style, traditionally, the stems will be laid behind the supporting stakes, but with some stems, their fall may dictate exactly where they fall. Don't worry about this, this is part of the hedge lane process.
Once all the pleaching is done and all the stakes are in place, it is now time to introduce the binding. Traditionally, this will also be coppice hazel, but willow can also be used. Do not worry if you don't pick this up straight away, as it took me a few years to be able to perfect this. To start the binding process off, you will need two binders twisted together on the first stake of the hedge. A gentle twist is applied. The bus ends of these first two binders are placed in front of the first stake, behind the second stake, then in front of the third stake. This is the only time you will do this. There on then, you will need one binder per stake as you move down the hedge. The bus end of your third binder will go behind the first stake, underneath the two you have just placed. In front of the second stake, behind the third stake, then in front of the fourth stake. Every binder from then in should finish at the front of the hedge. A new binder should be pus behind every stake as you move down the hedge. The butt end of your new binder should go underneath the binders that are already in place. Again, this process is not easily demonstrated through the film alone, and this really is a task you will be perfecting in person. It is better to place your binding too high than it is too low because this will be easy to correct. It has to be said that these are all areas of real finesse. And for any beginner, just mastering the simple process of binding is certainly good enough. As a very final act, all stakes are levelled off to the desired height. When cutting these stakes, we try and create an angle of about 35 to 45 degrees. Again, allowing rainwater to run off to prevent the tops of the stakes from rotting. These slopes should be similar to the angle of the features in the hedge. If you catch the hedge lane bug as I have, soon you might find you'll become very particular about how your hedges are laid. This hedge is all right by me. Thank you for watching. And if any of you want to take your hedge lane interests any further, why not inquire with Warwickshire Wildlife Trust and see if there are any courses available.